Unity of Houston is an inclusive church where we seek to understand and live the teachings of Jesus and other spiritual masters. At Unity, we welcome all people from all spiritual paths and every walk of life. We celebrate the diversity of our city and of our world, and we teach love, tolerance, and oneness, seeking to live in harmony with open minds and open hearts. Wherever you are in your spiritual path, you are always welcome at Unity. Join us and discover that the life of your dreams is already within you. I want to let you know that um, not everybody likes the music in church, and this is a letter that came to a pastor about the music at last week's service. And this is legit, y'all. This is real. I'm very disappointed by the new music you brought to our church. The selection last week was particularly crass. I found nothing spiritual or inspirational about it at all. The tune was unsingable. The theology was pedestrian and questionable, and the harmonies were distorted and unpleasant to the ear. That letter was written in 1890, and the song they were referring to is What a Friend We Have in Jesus. <laughs> One of the most popular and beloved hymns of Christianity for the 19th and 20th century. So if you don't like what we're doing, just hang around a little bit. It's going to be all right. So today we're continuing our, our prosperity series. All July, we're going to be talking about prosperity, but it's prosperity in all ways. It's the same principle that will bring a sense of abundance in our relationships, in our work life, in our, our sense of vocation, in, and also in our sense of the experience of good in life. It's one principle that shows up in different ways. Sometimes we get hooked in thinking it's just about the money, just about financial good. Now, we don't shy away from that. Reverend Karen Tudor, our senior associate minister, brought a beautiful message last week to kick us off on this series. I was up in Dallas at my former community there helping them celebrate some anniversaries, and um, Karen did a great job of talking about that money is just one of the ways that the energy of God flows to, through, and from us. And it's powerful work. So if you haven't had a chance to listen to Reverend Karen's talk, I would really encourage you to do so. It's on our website, on YouTube. It's on a uh, podcast. You can go to the podcast store and you can listen to it. It's really great. So today I want to expand that a little bit. And today we're talking about the way we experience prosperity, abundance as relationship. Relationship is, I've... Let me start this again. Sometimes I start a sentence four different ways because I, I really don't, I want to make sure I get it right. This comes from um, the beginning, at least. I want to start with Brene Brown, Dr. Brene Brown from University of Houston. She's quite famous and with Oprah and all that now. But she, she talked about this in, I think, her first TED Talk that she did at U of H. And she said, we are hardwired for connection. So that's my title for today's message, hardwired for connection. Do you know that if babies are not held, they don't thrive? And sometimes they will even die. If they're just, if they're given the, the food and water they need or whatever, but if they're not held, that human touch and contact, they will not thrive. In some cultures, the most severe punishment that can be given for someone who violates the, the moral code is that they are shunned. It's not that they're whipped or beaten or imprisoned. It's that they are made invisible in the community. All connection is withdrawn. And people suffer. And they wilt and diminish if they're not connected. And think about it, even in our own penal system, which we, I think we can all agree we can do a better job there. But the worst thing we can do, well, there's the death penalty, but there's also solitary confinement. We withdraw connection. And Dr. Brene, she says that we are hardwired for this connection, and what keeps us from connecting is a sense of shame. She's a, she's a, she, everything she does is based on research. She is in the social work department over there, and she talked about in her, one of her videos that she was invited by a group of River Oaks ladies to give a talk, and, and they said, how shall we... What kind of a title do you want to use? She said, well, I'm a shame researcher. And the lady said, that's not going to work uh, for my group. So how about we call you a storyteller instead? And she said, may as well call me a, a magical fairy pixie. <laughs> the academic in her didn't appreciate that. But in all of her research, it shows that 
What keeps people from thriving, abundant, heart-centered lives is that they're unable to connect because of their shame. And that by being vulnerable and authentic with one another, we drop the armor and the protection and we can see each other in our humanity. And then the, the layer that I feel like we bring to that here in unity is we do see each other in our humanity, in our problems, our struggles, and we also see each other in our divinity. That we see that each of us is some particularly needed and unique and irreplaceable aspect of God's own heart that needed to be expressed as a human lifetime with all of it, all of the things that we experience in, as being a human being. And it's coming up a lot in this community that we want to create better doorways for different ways for people to find true community and connection here. I've been saying it a lot that I believe we live in the most connected and the loneliest disconnected generation that humanity has ever seen. We can take out our phones and we can see what's happening with the storm in Louisiana. We can see what's happening with the war in the Middle East. We can check, we can be connected all around the world. But it's not uncommon nowadays for people to go days without human touch or human actual conversation. And we are withering. It's degrading to our sense of well-being. I believe that it's degrading our, the, the social co connection and contract, our, our sense of being a community. And so that, truly, I believe that's our, the thing that we still offer. You know, you can get these teachings of unity online now anywhere, but you can't get community. You have to be in the room to meet people, to share your experience, to get supported. One of the, the images that came to me early on when we started doing this work was of a tapestry. And you think about that idea that you take an individual thread and it's really easy to break, right? Just pull it and it snaps apart. But with many threads that are woven together, the fabric is strong. And what I've seen, the thing that sort of revealed to me, the insight I had about that, that every thread in a tapestry, it's supported by the threads around it, but it also supports. And that's what we do for each other. And that is abundance. When we can have our hearts open to meet and to connect and to love. We, have, we do it a lot of ways. Our spirit groups, recently a member of our spirit group um, suffered a major stroke and was unable to speak. And it was her daughter noticed that she was getting emails from this group at church, a new member in our community. We didn't know her very well. And that group has been visiting her, connecting with her those threads of fabric supporting this woman who has gone through this major thing. That's what I see for us, that we're able to pr pr provide a space where we can experience abundance, prosperity in the way we love and the way we are loved. We've all seen people that have a lot of material goods and they're not connected, they're lonely, they're, they're unhappy. And then we've also seen the opposite, people that haven't had a lot of money, but they experience this richness and abundance of, of love. Dolly Parton, she talks about her upbringing where they didn't have anything but love. And I love, anybody else love Dolly Parton? Am I the only Dolly lover in here? Man, I just love her. A couple of Dollyisms. She says, I'm the fakest looking real person you'll ever meet. <laughs> Somebody asked her once if she was offended by dumb blonde jokes, and she said, no, because I'm not blonde, and I'm not, no, I'm not dumb, and I'm not blonde. I killed my punchline. <laughs> but she talks about that they didn't have anything in terms of material good, but they had love. She was loved, and I believe that that love gave her the confidence to bring her gift and to develop it, and now she's quite well off. And, you know, she's so generous. I talked two weeks ago about generosity as a spiritual practice. And, and she's built this whole amusement park there where she grew up to give income and revenue and work to the people in that very economically challenged part of our nation. That's, that's what it's about. And, when, and the, the Dolly is an example, too, that she, she had this abundance and prosperity around love, which then helped her create prosperity and abundance in financial means, too. And it works that way. That as we begin to practice generosity, it shows up the flow of God's good moves in every aspect of our lives. And when we begin to work on our, our, our financial giving, we can see that we will become more open to receive love and blessing. We'll find more work that is more fulfilling to us. We will, it, 
we can, we can enter into that, that beautiful practice of giving and receiving in any way. And some of you may be in a place where you're financially challenged. I still invite you to give. Find a way you can give of your time, your talent, of yourself. And if it's not here, do it somewhere. But this is a great place to do it. You can volunteer. You can join a class. You can join a small group. Just begin to let people know who you are. Share your, your triumphs and your struggles. And you will experience an abundance that I think you're, you'll be amazed at what God will bless you with. We are hardwired for connection. John Philip Newell is a, church, is a minister of the Church of Scotland. And he has done a lot of beautiful work on recapturing this non-dual thread of Christianity as expressed through the Celtic tradition, a very ancient theology and spirituality. He says this, we are not an exception to the cosmos. We are not an addendum. Humanity has emerged from within the matter of the cosmos. We express the nature of the universe. What is deepest in us, our longing for relationship, reveals a yearning that is within all things. A few years ago, before I began ministerial school, but I was well along my spiritual path of recovery and study and practice of new thought, I noticed this feeling of yearning in me. And it wasn't for a specific thing. It wasn't like I wanted to achieve or to acquire something. I just, my heart was just yearning. Sometimes it would show up as I would really miss my grandmother who died when I was 12. My heart would just ache with this yearning. And I didn't know what it was. But I was singing and speaking at a church in Huntsville, Alabama. And my friend David Leonard is the minister there. He's crazy. He's a Broadway dancer turned new thought minister who's also a Sufi. And, uh, and I knew he would be the one to talk to about this. And, and we're sitting at a little Thai restaurant in Huntsville, Alabama. And I'm telling him about this yearning of my heart. And I'm crying. And I said, I don't know, what is this? And he looked at me and he smiled. And he starts crying. He said, oh, honey, you're just feeling what God feels for you. That it's built into reality. This desire to connect. God is loving you and asking for your attention and your time, your openness. We were, John and I had the privilege, um, thank you, to attend the Young Center Benefit Gala at the River Oaks Country Club a few weeks ago, and Dr. Brene Brown was the keynote speaker, and she was talking about her new book, which is fabulous, about leadership. It's called Dare to Lead. And she asked this room, I don't know, three or 400 people, lots of therapists and smart, um, evolved people, and she said, what do you think is the greatest obstacle to courageous leadership? And all these people said, fear. And when she nodded, and she said, yeah, I thought so too, but that's not what the research shows. She said, it's our armor, which I had someone after the first service point out that that's our fear too, that we're afraid of authentic, of being seen, so we armor up. We don't let people see who we really are. And it is the deepest obstacle to us having the life of fulfillment, connection, and abundance in our relationships. Who you are is perfect, even with your stuff. If you can find a few relationships where you can come and just be who you are, And here's the thing, we are not perfect people. As a matter of fact, some church, I wish I'd thought of it, their slogan is, no perfect people allowed. (laughs) I love that. But we, we aim our hearts to God. And we seek to be on this path of healing and recovery and evolution. And then we can just bring who we are into it, and we will find support. I have a friend in in AA um, who has since passed on. I may have mentioned this just came to mind, but many, many years he's worked for the FBI, hardened, hard-bitten lawman, and he talked about this authentic sharing. He said, there were things that I swore to God I would take to my grave that now I've, I've spoken at a podium in front of 10,000 people. <laughs> yeah. It's just human stuff. And our unwillingness to be seen in that way will keep us stuck, it will keep us isolated. I wanted to tell a story. I've been 
really struck by the power of story. We had our, at our annual convention in Kansas City a few weeks ago, that was the, the theme was one humanity, many stories. And, and I was, and I may not do it every Sunday, but every, I've done it every Sunday since convention. And I really wanted to see if there was a story to me that spoke about this idea of authentic connection and experiencing God's abundance through relationship. And, and one did come to mind. It's a great love story. This comes from the, the Hebrew Bible. It's a small little book stuck right between Judges and 1 Samuel in four chapters, the whole story. This is the story of Ruth and Naomi. And if you're not a Bible person, it's a good story. If you are a Bible person, I invite you to listen to it a little differently. This was written by, created by a different, in a different time and a different culture, so some of those references and the ways that they did things won't make any sense to us. We're not of that time or those people. And yet some of it is so universal. So on this teaching, we're doing abundance and prosperity. I'm going to start with a story with famine and death. How does that sound? <laughs> Abimelech was the, the patriarch of this family, and his wife was Naomi, and they had two sons whose names I'm not going to try and remember right now. <laughs> And they lived in Bethlehem, Judea. And a famine came upon the land. And Abimelech knew that he wanted to keep his family whole and intact and alive. And so he made the very, I'm sure, difficult decision to move his family to the country of Moab, the, the neighboring nation, which had been the enemy, the oppressor of the Israelites. They had been, um, their practices were different. Their sexual morals were different. It was, they were the bad guys. They were like, don't go look into those, don't go to that Moabite place. They're bad over there. That's what the, the people would say to their kids. And yet here, Abimelech decided to move his family to Moab. And while he's there, they were able to keep the family alive, but then he died. So here's Naomi, a widow in a foreign land with her two sons. And they decided that they needed to marry to keep the family going. And so they married two women from Moab, Ruth and Orpah. Just a little aside, um, Oprah Winfrey's family chose the name for her out of the Bible, but somebody misspelled it in the family Bible. So she's supposed to be named Orpah, but her name is Oprah. Unique. She could probably teach a little bit about abundance. What do you think? <laughs> anyway, back to the story. And so after these sons had married, the sons both died as well. So now Naomi, a stranger, an immigrant in a new land, with all of her blood family have died. And these two daughters-in-law that she loved, and we don't, the story doesn't give us a lot of the backstory or the, what happened, but we know that she loved these young women as her own daughters because it says that she made the decision to return to Bethlehem and they wanted to come with her. And she said, why would you come with me? There's nothing Binding us together anymore. Your, your husbands, my sons, have died. My husband has died. There's nothing here. And they said, no, we love you. We want to come with you. And they began down the road back to Bethlehem. And she said again, go back to your own families. Go back to your mother and father's house. You can marry again. It's not too late for you to build a new life. But I'm too old to marry and we will not have that connection again. It's kind of silly. She said, even if I were to get married today and have sons, would you wait until they grew up to marry them? <laughs> She's like, it's ridiculous. There's nothing here between us. And Orpah listened to what her beloved mother-in-law said and knew that she was looking out for her own benefit, so she did. She went back to her mother's house. But Ruth did not. And in verse 16 of the first chapter of the book of Ruth, she says, But Ruth, Ruth replied, Do not urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will become my people. And your God, my God. It's a very famous verse. It's often read at weddings. And I don't think most people realize that it's not about a husband and a wife or a husband and a husband or a wife and a wife. It's about a mother-in-law who loved her daughter-in-law as her own flesh and blood. And the daughter-in-law said, I will give up the family of my, 
of my origin, the country of my origin, my traditions, my religion, because I love you so much. What you have given me has transformed me. I will follow you. And they made their way back to Bethlehem. When they got to the city, the women came around Naomi and they said, Is it Naomi? Have you returned? And she said, Do not call me Naomi, which means pleasing or pleasant. Instead, call me Mara, which means bitter. She said, I have lost it all. When they got settled in Bethlehem, Ruth said, I will go and find a way for us to eat. And so she said, I will go find a landowner. It's the barley harvest now, and I will find someone who will be kind to me and let me glean in their fields. And so she did that, and she went out and she found a particular field where the harvesters had come through, and it was a tradition in the, for the Jewish people in the ancient times that they, it's actually written in the law in Leviticus and Deuteronomy that you are to leave a corner of your field for the widow, for the orphan, for the immigrant, for those who cannot sow for themselves. And so she was picking up the grain left behind, trying, trying to stay alive for herself and her beloved mother-in-law, Naomi. And the owner of the land was a man named Boaz. And he came and he saw her there, and he didn't recognize her, and so he asked his overseers, like, who is this? He says, who does she belong to? Not in a hierarchical way, but what family? Who is she from? How is she, how is she making her way in this world? Who are your people? That's the way we say it in the South. <laughs> and the overseer said, this was the daughter-in-law of your kinswoman, Naomi. And Boaz said, oh, I've heard about this story. I've heard about her kindness to Naomi. The word in Hebrew is chesed. This word is often used to describe love between two people, but it's also used to describe God's mercy and love for all people. Chesed. He said, I've heard of this chesed that Ruth has shown for Naomi. And it moved him. He went over to her and he, and he introduced himself as the owner of the field. It says, she bowed down with her forehead on the ground. And he said, I know of the kindness, the chesed you have shown to my kinswoman, Naomi. I want you to only glean in my field. I will protect you. I told, I've told my overseers that you are to be guarded. Because then, as now, for a single woman making her way in the world, it was tough at times. And so... She began this relationship. She went home, and he also fed her as though he was feeding his own employees. And she couldn't, gave her so much food for lunch, she couldn't eat it all. And she took the leftover food, and she took all the grain she had harvested. She took it back to Naomi, pleased, just proud to show what she had brought. And Naomi said, where were you? Who, who, who showed you this chesed, this kindness? And she said, it was your kinsman, Boaz. Naomi was touched. This Mara, this bitterness began to melt in her. And she said, Ah, God is still merciful to his people. Blessed be the Lord. And so, for the rest of the harvest, Ruth was able to gather grain. And, and Boaz, he said to his overseers, Make sure you leave plenty for Ruth to glean. Even take some of the stalks you've already harvested and lay them down for her. Boaz referred to her as daughter, which makes us think that he was probably an older man. We're not given any indication of whether he was married. We don't believe he was married or have children. We're not sure. doesn't matter. But at the end of the harvest, Naomi got an idea for her daughter-in-law, Ruth. They had had enough to eat through the harvest time, but now what would happen? And so she got this bold plan to protect the future for this young woman that she had come to love as her own flesh and blood. And she told her to do this. Here's the story gets a little, it's hard for us to know what it meant culturally, but I'll just tell you what the Bible says. It said, go bathe and anoint thyself with perfume. Put on your finest raiment, your garment. And when, when Boaz is in the threshing 
on the threshing floor. He's separating the grain from the chaff. And at the end of the day, he will eat and drink and he will sleep there. You are to go into the threshing floor, uncover his feet and lie there. This may be a euphemism for something. <laughs> Scholars disagree. But I was telling Karen, it reminded me of this song. I think it's a Jackson Brown song that the Indigo Girls cover. But it goes, you and me, babe, how about it? I think that was the point. <laughs> Ruth came in here and she's like, what do you think, Boaz? In some way. Boaz woke, around said at midnight, he awoke in fear. There's somebody there. He said, who is it? She said, it is I, your kinswoman, Ruth. He knows her to be a woman of great virtue and of great generosity, of chesed. And he is not going to abuse her kindness. And his heart is broken open, and he says, Ruth, you could have pursued a younger man with your rich or poor to be your husband and start a life, and yet you have come here to me. There was another ancient law for the Jewish people at that time, the, the provider, redeemer, protector, that there was a law that if a, if a woman lost her husband, the next of kin would marry her and keep the, the land in the family tradition, in the, in the, the, keep the inheritance intact. And this isn't exactly in alignment with that, but Boaz said, I, I could be your redeemer, protector, but there is another man who is closer in kin. So I want to do this for you but I have to do it the right way. He said, tomorrow I will get up at sunrise and I will go find my kinsman and I will see if he will be your redeemer protector or if I can marry you. And so the next day he's at the city gate waiting for his kinsman to come in. He sees him, he says, um, come here a minute. I got something I want to talk to you about. And he said, you know that Abimelech had died and Naomi is back and she would like to sell the family land but our tradition is that we would buy it and keep it in the family, and it's yours. You are the next of kin. You would be the one to become the redeemer protector. And the, the kinsman said, yes, I would do that. And he said, but you will need to marry Ruth because they have become family. And the kinsman said, I, I cannot do that. I have to look after my own inheritance. You, Boaz. You become the redeemer protector of this family. You buy this land. You marry this woman from Moab. Karen reminded me in the first service, it's a very unusual story for many times. First, that it's about women. Second, that this is a foreigner who is being grafted into the tribe of Israel. So, Boaz was able to purchased the land, become the redeemer protector, was able to marry Ruth, and shortly after they were blessed with a son. They placed this baby boy in Naomi's arms, the grandmother who thought her line had ended. And though she shared not a strand of DNA with this baby boy, he was hers. And she loved him, became his nurse. They named that baby Obed. Obed grew up, and he had a, a wife and married and had a son named Jesse. Jesse had many sons, the youngest of which was David, who became the king of Israel to re reunite the northern and the southern tribes, became the greatest king, and his son Solomon, all the way down to Jesus of Nazareth. We are in the, the lineage of Ruth and Naomi. And this love that so gave in the face of famine and death. They said, I will follow my heart. I will follow you. A love like that will transform your life. The family was restored. Prosperity was returned. What's the point for us today, my brothers and my sisters? Is that we have the opportunity to say yes to love, to go where love goes, to have love's people become our people, to have the God of love become our God, 
we're to go back to the way that we know. The earthly way that will keep, you know, just pay attention to the bottom line. If you're on a spiritual path, you are called to evolve and to move to become more of who you are, to lay down your false and limiting ideas and step into the true abundant life that Jesus came to give us. And the, one of the ways that we do that is by being open-hearted one to another and loving. I have been transformed by the love of people in church from the time I was that big, Obed size. Until this day, I have continued to receive the gifts of people in spiritual community that love me despite my flaws, sometimes in because of them, <laughs> and love me into being more of who I came here to be. That's happening right now. I have people in this church who will call me up and be like, Michael, that thing you said, we got to talk about that. And I receive it. I keep my heart open keep my guard down. And that's the way. Let's take a breath. There is a door of love open for you in this community. If you have been on the periphery, if you have been just coming in as a spectator, I invite you to come in deeper. Volunteer, join a spirit group, take a class, introduce yourself to the people you're sitting next to after. Find a way to let your heart be connected. Love will never lead you wrong. This is a place of transformation and healing. I'm grateful to be your minister. I'm grateful that you are here today. God bless you. I love you. Thank you for watching this message today. I'd like to invite you to join us in person here on campus at Unity of Houston for Sunday morning or Wednesday evening services. If you can't be with us here on our campus, you can still join us live on Facebook or on our website, unityhouston.org. Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. Central.